Good morning, and welcome to Park Hill. We're glad you guys are here today. It's a little rainy and nasty outside, but you know what? That's okay, because it's almost Christmas. <laughs> I sure hope you had a great Thanksgiving day this past, uh, this past week, and that you had family and were able to spend some time with them, in a safe way, of course. Uh, but we're glad you've chosen to be with us, either in person today or online. We're so glad you're here. Uh, just want to make one announcement as we get started. Actually, two announcements. The first is even more important than the second, and the first is we have our pastor back. Ken Shaddix is back with us, and we are so thankful for that. I want you to know, Ken, nothing broke while you were gone. Everybody was fine, and we, we did okay, but we missed you, man. We're glad you're back in the saddle. Going to be uh, looking forward to hearing you preach in a moment. Uh, second announcement is, though, that this Wednesday evening, you know, normally we have Wednesday nights, so supper, and a lot of time to get together and, and see new uh, faces we hadn't seen in a while and just spend some good time together. We don't do that anymore, for the, at least for right now because of COVID, and we understand that. But this Wednesday night, we're having a special meeting up here at the church. It's one of your favorites, I'm sure. It's a special, special budget meeting to, uh, for the church to pre be presented, the 2021 budget. The good thing about that is it's not 2020. It's going to be 2021. We're moving forward. We're looking forward for next year. So if you and your family would like to spend that time with us, uh, we're going to be here in the sanctuary. It begins at 6 p.m. this Wednesday evening, but it's also going to be available online. So if you want to take that opportunity, uh, please go to parkhillbaptist.org backslash budget meeting, and you'll be able to find your link to the, uh, to the, to the meeting this Wednesday night. I look forward to seeing you here, uh, either here in person or online this Wednesday evening. Once again, thank you for being with us. Let's begin with prayer. It is the Christmas season. There's nothing more special to us than celebrating the birth of our Savior. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much. Thank you that we had the opportunity this past week to stop, hopefully spend time with family, and to say thank you for all your many blessings. The one that we are most thankful for is the fact that you came to us in the form of a baby. We thank you for all the things, that, the blessings that, that was brought because of what you have done for us through your son, Jesus Christ. We celebrate him this morning. We worship him this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
just stand as we continue to worship as we begin this Advent season. Oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel, which means God. You will give birth to a son. You'll give him the name Emmanuel, which means God with us. I hope you're thankful today that even as we stand in this place, he is our Emmanuel. He is God. to save his people from their sins.
God with us. What a great promise that came to be. You may be seated as you're in this place. Thank you so much for being here as we continue to worship. The King of kings who left his throne above. How many kings? Only one, and his name was Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thank you. 
God, we're so thankful that you gave up your one and only son for us. Your scripture proclaims that, God, you so loved the world that you gave your one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And we thank you for that promise. We thank you for that hope. We thank you today, even now, for your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, good morning to each of you that are here in person. And those of you that are joining us online, it is great to be back with you after several weeks being away, but it's uh, good to be back in this place and to be among friends and brothers and sisters in Christ. It is a joy. Uh, I need to say something before I get into the message, and that is simply an expression of my heart of thanks to you as a church. Uh, my family thanks you for the opportunity, along with other pastors, from time to time to have a sabbatical, a little time away to do things off the radar and uh, different ways. And just, just want you to know, I deeply appreciate the time this last month and would be remiss if I didn't say thank you uh, to you. I grew a beard. <laughs> and that was fun. <laughs> And Judy and I hiked up to Nancy Mountain Shelter on the Washita Trail slowly but surely and had a picnic lunch. That was good. Been able to do some things I'm not normally able to do, and I want to say thank you uh, to the church. I also want to express my thanks to Garrick and to Mark and to Josh and Bob, these four men that have preached over the last month. Thank you for preaching. Thank you for sharing God's word, blessing the people, along with our church staff for just being uh, faithful and allowing us from time to time to step out. Uh, Dave, the worship team, so many others to say thank you for. Well, today you may know this or you may not know this, but this marks uh, the beginning of the week of prayer for international missions and giving to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Some of you know what that's about. You do that every year. You've been doing that for a long time. Some of you may say, I don't really know much about that. But this is a time of year where we as a church, along with many other thousands of churches, join together to pray in a specific way for uh, those missionaries that serve in different countries and languages and places around the world. I hope you'll give generously, sacrificially to our Lottie Moon Christmas offering. Uh, our goal personally as a church is $87,000. Just to make sure you're with me, would you say that? It's a pretty big number, $87,000. That's kind of our goal as a church. And then when you add up all the Southern Baptist churches, uh, a lot of different places, our, our goal as a Southern Baptist convention to give to this mission offering so that missionaries might have resources and do their job, spread the gospel. Our entire goal as a, a convention, it's a big number, it's $175 million. So I uh, just want you to know about that as I try to inform and give you an idea of where we are. And so they give you this idea like preach on, <laughs> and this is kind of the assigned text uh, they didn't give me many notes with it, but the assigned text is Revelation chapter 7, and the title of the message is A Great Multitude Plus You, A Great Multitude and You. So if you have your Bible, let's look at the last book in the New Testament, the book of Revelation, and there you'll find uh, a few verses, the message that John gives us. Verse 9 says, After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands and they cried out in a loud voice salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures they fell down on their faces before the throne and they worshiped note that word they worshiped God saying amen praise and glory 
and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Now, every preacher's got to like that. You got an amen at the start of that, and you got an amen at the, the end of that, an amen and an amen, and all those uh, quality words of worship that we'll talk about in a moment. Well, it's time for me to confess that I don't know everything about the book of Revelation. In fact, uh, just to be honest with you, I, I am no expert on this final book. Uh, some of you study it and know it far better than I do, but today I want to take the, the text from Revelation 7, and I want to present basically just two things that we can learn from, okay? And I hope you'll make some notes, maybe where you are at home that you're uh, stopping long enough to make some notes, or maybe right here in person today to understand this text as we think about missions and the gospel. Here's the first thing to, to pick out of the the passage today, and that is in verse 9. Notice, if you will, the multitudes that are reached by the gospel. You say, what's this all about? Well, it tells us that in God's economy, God's scope of things, that God is going to reach a lot of people with the message of the gospel. Did you notice the words in verse 9? After this I looked and there before me was a great multitude. Mark that down, a, a great multitude. And then specifically, John says, as he, he looked at this vision in heaven, all nations and tribe and people and language are represented in this vast throng of people. Now that's pretty exciting. I want to be clear that when we talk about the gospel reaching people of all different nationalities and places, we, we probably need to just clarify the gospel. What, what is the gospel? Because it is a message that centers in the person of Jesus Christ, his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection. So Jesus makes a uh, he is the core of the gospel. What he did, who he is, what he accomplished is the message that the church is to share with the community and with the world. And so when you reach this gospel and preach this gospel to, to people around you, the gospel reaches out and it touches, as we're seeing here, so many. The result of this is the range or the scope of the message is great multitudes were uh, there in that picture. Now, that's, again, pretty exciting. Large people, uh, large gatherings. I, I tried to think in my own mind what was the, maybe the largest collection gathering of people I've ever been in. Maybe you could think about that in your mind, like a time where you were with a lot of people. I've been to... Um, Watch a Razorback game a few times up in Fayetteville, and a lot of people, you know, they heard in, heard out. And I've been to a Razorback game just like you have. That's pretty exciting. I, I know some of you that are students, some of you that have been in college ministry have been to Atlanta, and you've been in a huge coliseum at Passion Conferences, and you've been there with a lot of energy and a lot of uh, people together praising God. I've been to places like, yeah, I, I guess I can confess this. I, I, Judy and I went, went several years ago to Springfield, Missouri, to a Tim McGraw and a Faith Hill concert. Just remember, be humble and kind. <laughs> and then one time, I remember, we went with some friends. We went down to, I guess it's the Simmons Bank Arena, and we, we listened to James Taylor, J.T., smooth lots of people bigger than that greater than that is what John says when he says I looked and I saw this mass group of people in fact you could not count all the people too many in the multitude too many in the mass of people to even attempt 
to count. And there they were from all nation, tribe, people, and language. It was a multicultural, international, cosmopolitan type of uh, viewpoint that he saw. One commentator at this point said uh, this was kind of like if you could picture in your mind an ancient first century seaport or harbor where you would see all these ships and people of different nationalities. They would all come in doing their thing trading and uh, merchants that were there, all these different parts of the world coming in. Well, John says, I'm looking, and as I look in this heavenly scene, I see that the gospel, the message of Jesus, has reached people from all corners of the world. That's exciting. I remember as a kid growing up in church, one of the first songs I remember in my mind is, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. The gospel, the message of Jesus, reaches a great diversity of people. This should not surprise us that the gospel is for the world because Jesus told his own church, his own disciples in the Great Commission, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of what? All nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The gospel is not for just a small part of the world. The gospel is a a message that transforms a person. And gives us new life in Jesus. And it touches the entire world. John looks and says, I see people from everywhere. Acts 1.8, maybe you mark that down. It's a good passage as well. Jesus was saying to his early believers, disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria, and to the entire world. So what I'm trying to say is when John saw this in John 7, he is seeing the world being reached by a message that centers in the person of Jesus. And that's good to know. God cares for all the people of the world. God cares for the millions and God cares for the billions of people. 194 countries, 7 billion plus people in this world. And God cares for all of us. And God cares for you. Where you sit, where you listen today, God cares for the world and God cares for you. The multitudes are reached and in the midst of that, you care. You are cared for by by the Lord. The gospel and missions go together. I remember singing years ago, maybe point of grace way back in the day, but God loves people more than anything. God loves people more than anything. More than anything, he wants them to know he'd rather die than let them go because God loves people more than anything. John looks and he sees so many people he can't even count them. And they look different from all places of the world. And God has redeemed them and made them new in Christ. And there they are gathered around this throne, this heavenly place of worship. And God cares for the world. So let me just say it this way. Today, let me expand our minds and our borders because God loves people in Brazil. And God loves people in Japan. And God loves people in Sweden. And God loves people in South Africa. And God loves people in North Korea. Because he loves the entire world. North, south, east, west. All nation, tribe, people, languages. The scope of the gospel is worldwide. Big cities and and small little villages hardly on the map. And the presence of God, the message of Jesus can go into any of those. Find people where they are. And we can come to know a redeeming, loving Savior in Jesus. He came as a baby, but he grew with a mission in mind to save people all over the world. And this is what we believe and why we have missionaries that are, you know, 3,585 international missionaries as of June 2020. And they're in all languages and places and scattered across the globe. I got to say this and move on. I'm trying to watch time, too. You remember like the week before I went on sabbatical, I preached like 12.15 or 12.20. 
And I haven't preached in a month. So I make no guarantees. <laughs> but we're doing all right. So let's press into this. And I, I want you to catch this because historic background is important. John, near the end of the first century, is on the island of Patmos. He's exiled there for preaching the message about Jesus, the gospel. So he's put on an island. And the church is being persecuted in the first century as we think about it. But there, as we think of John and the New Testament church, you know, there's something interesting. In the book of Acts, you read about the day of Pentecost. Remember that? Acts chapter 2, this day where the Spirit of God fell on the early church. And it was a mighty day. And the Scripture even says that, you know, 3,000 3, people were saved or came to know Christ. Wow. But if I could add to that, I would say that much of what you read about in the New Testament is not about big numbers, but it's about small numbers in different locations, like Corinth and Ephesus and Laodicea. Like, where is the gospel? What happens at the end of the first century with the gospel? Even though the gospel is advancing, does it reach many people? And we don't know its extent. But here, when we read about Revelation 7 and the extent of all these people, we understand that the gospel works and the gospel saves people from sin. So what can we grasp here? We can be uh, optimistic. Man, this has been a downer year. Anybody like 2020? Like your favorite year of life? For those watching online, nobody raised their hand in this place, okay? We've all struggled. It's all been a disruption. It's just been crazy. We've really not had the best of years. But I can be optimistic when I know that the gospel that we as a church or we as the people of Christ share changes lives so much so that every tribe, nation, language, and people is affected now I'm going to be a good Southern Baptist pastor because I've read my literature <laughs> but I caught a line in some things I was reading about international missions and, and the statement was made every church has a role to play in reaching every nation with the gospel and I want to be about North Little Rock and Central Arkansas. I want to be a church that loves this community and ministers and does all we can to share hope and the promise of Christ where we are. But every church not only looks in a small dimension around them, but looks to the nations globally and says, we want to be a part of it. The multitudes that are reached by the gospel. That's part A, part B, only two parts today. Second point I want us to find as we're digging in to chapter 7 is simply this, the multitudes activity of worshiping Jesus. So you got this large gathering that John sees, and what are they involved in? They have white robes, just to give a little, make sure I studied, okay? White robes, what does that mean? That means imputed, there's a big word, imputed righteousness. That this group was made righteous and holy by the Lamb of God that saved them. They were given white robes. Their life was cleansed. And they had palm branches like we remember reading of Jesus coming in to the holy city. They spread out palm, those palm branches represent, ready, anybody taking notes? Joy and victory. Like they're there with a, a cleansed life and they've got lots of joy and victory because Jesus, the Lamb of God, the God that saves, has done something for them they could not do for themselves. And so the reaction is, as they cry out in verse 10, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. I hope you'll read that a dozen times today. The only one that can save is Jesus. And when we understand that he has saved our life, we just declare over and over again that salvation is from him. 
It's not by our merit, by our good deeds, by anything you've done that you can earn heaven or know Jesus, but we do that by the grace of God as salvation belongs to God who has given it. And then you come to this worship scene in verses 11 and 12. There is such a thing, and and you know this, there's individual worship, right? Nod your heads. Yeah, there's individual worship, like your quiet time, like your devotional time you do, you know, through the week. Just you and the Lord, an open Bible, prayer time, you sing to the Lord, you're, you're there, it's just you, not a big group, but just you, and you're, you're worshiping, you're reminding yourself of the goodness of God. There's individual worship, but then in this scene, there is the worship of the people, all the people that have been touched by the life of Jesus. It's not just you, it's, it's everyone through the ages, from the parts of the world, different languages, and they're all gathered together and they're saying salvation belongs to our God, to the Lamb of God. And that is the song, the declaration of worship that they give. I don't know that we have to wait to heaven or to someday or to think of it. I think we can do that right now. And part of the thing that I think we've all learned through 2020 is we miss being all together. Like, I'm glad you're here, but I, I, and I know some can't be here. And it just doesn't feel like we're all together, does it? There's this day coming and there is this reality now that when we worship God, it is a collective gathering of people of faith. So let me ask you something. You got to answer this and you don't have to answer this to anybody except you. If this is a scene of worship that John sees. I want to ask you, and man, I'm asking myself here right now. I want to ask, how is your worship life? Like how how big, how real, how, how close is worship as a part of you, your life, what you do day by day? Is, is worship a reality in your life? Because sometimes we get kind of dry. Would anybody admit that? That sometimes our word, we just kind of go through the motions or we kind of become lifeless. But here is a scene of worship where there is joy and excitement and thrill and enthusiasm. And so we have to ask ourselves individually as we think about this great group of worshipers, hey, how am I doing in my own own life when it comes to the practice of worship? Everybody has an altar. You have an altar that you worship. And something is on that altar that you bow down to. It may be the Lord Jesus, or it may be anything that this world says, chase after this and worship this. John says, I worshiped the Lamb, the God who gave salvation. And then you have these words. I'm going to spend just a moment with these because I think they're really good. They're they're good words. Again, notice in verse 12, uh, it's really a sevenfold song of worship like seven words that are being declared shouted out about the lamb of God Jesus and about the God that saves they they say this over and over again praise glory wisdom thanks honor power and strength man those are all full of meaning and it's what we should do now as we worship God we should remember him for who he is and that's a good list of seven things about God power I praise, glory, wisdom, thanks, honor, power, and strength. Could I take just a moment and uh, unpack those? I, I, I'll go pretty quick. Like you really have a vote in this? You really? I'm in charge, okay? I'm up here. I'm, this is my message. I'm preaching it. You got to listen, though. I, I mean, I worked on this, so here it is. I want to give you the seven things. Let's just talk about them for a second because they all combine to say the multitudes worship the Savior. Notice that first word, praise. 
It's a word that we get, our English language uh, translates the word eulogy, which means to speak well of someone. Praise in the church scene is that we speak well of the Lord. When you praise the Lord, you are saying, God, you are great, and you remember who God is for his goodness and speak well of the Lord. I think the best example of this is the Psalms, Psalm 1 to Psalm 150. There's this declaration of all through the Psalms of praise the Lord. I like what Psalm 34 verse 1 says, I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. In fact, I want us to do something and pretty mechanical. If you have your iPhone and you look up Scripture that way, you have your open Bible right there, we're going to do it. I'm going to challenge you to do it. Look at Psalm 146. Just go back there real fast. And maybe you've noted this, but I just thought it's worth sharing. Psalm 146. Notice how it begins. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. And then notice how Psalm 146 finishes. Praise the Lord. Start to finish. Praise the Lord. Look at Psalm 147. How's it start? Praise the Lord. Turn all the way down to the last verse in that chapter. How's it end? Praise the Lord. How's Psalm 148 begin? Praise the Lord. How's it end? Praise the Lord. How's Psalm 149 begin? Praise the Lord. How does it end? Praise the Lord. How does Psalm 150 begin? Praise the Lord. And then there's all kinds of praise. There's even the indication of dancing in the Lord. (laughs) That's another day and time. Praise, 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 praise. All these praises there in Psalm 150. And then it concludes, the whole book says at the very end, Praise the Lord. I think God calls us to praise Him in good times and bad times. God inhabits the praise of His people. So in this heavenly scene, John says, there was praise, and then he uses the word glory. Quick admission here. I don't know that I can really explain this word. It's beyond me. The word speaks of splendor and worth and brilliance. The glory of God. It's what we sometimes sing, to God be the glory, great things he has done. It is what we find in the Old Testament when in Exodus chapter 40, the glory of the Lord filled the temple. It's what we learn from the New Testament. Hey, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And then Isaiah, when he saw this vision and the the crowd around Isaiah chapter 6, as they cried out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. John Piper says the glory of God is his glory. It's the public display of the radiance of his holiness. That's why I don't know that I can really understand it or speak it well, but it is that of God where it's too much for us. The glory of the Lord. And they saw this as John saw the people of God in more numbers than you could ever count gathered. They praised God, and there was the glory of God. (laughs) Wow. And then there's the wisdom. That's the third word in the sevenfold song. Wisdom belongs to God. God is all wise. He knows better than we do. And I don't understand. I cannot give you a good explanation of 2020. I mean, I'm just like you. I, I'm frustrated in many ways and confused and sometimes struggle. I don't understand everything about what's going on right now. But I fully believe and am confident that God is all wise and God knows better than I do. And I'm going to keep my trust in him. And we're going to keep our trust in him. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord, our God. He is all wise. And he even gives us the opportunity to ask when we don't understand. We can ask for wisdom in James chapter 1. The next word is the word thanks. We've just been through Thanksgiving. I like Thanksgiving. I like turkey. I like dressing. 
I like mashed potatoes. I like gravy. I like Judy's cooking. I like Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving is a good place, good time. Gathering, not like we used to, but gathering, remembering that we have a lot to be thankful for. So there, in that heavenly scene, John says, there was thanks being declared, and the opposite of thanks is what? Ingratitude. My God, we can either be thankful or we can just say, eh, let's be thankful people. (laughs) We have so much to be thankful for today. Count your many blessings, name them one by one. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. There was thanks in this heavenly worship season. It'll be there then, but it's supposed to be here now. We are a thankful people. And if you're online today and you're still watching, bless you. You might even say to Josh as he's back in the back room monitoring today online, you might say, amen. Amen. He's good. Thankful for a God who has done so much for us. And then they have the word honor. Let's quickly go through this honor. Uh, The word is a good word. Sometimes a judge comes into a courtroom and we stand in honor of the judge. Sometimes a student, a boy or girl student, does really well academically. They are on the honor roll. Sometimes Veterans Day, we remember veterans, their service, and we honor veterans. Sometimes we remember the scripture that says, honor your father and your mother. Honor. We are to honor God. And the word means valuable. Something about God is valuable and rare. And so we honor God. And then the word power. God shows his power. How how does God show his power? Remember what God's done? Creation. Beginning of the Bible, he speaks, the world comes into being power of God, the power to part the waters of the Red Sea, the power of Jesus to do miracles, to heal people that were sick, to feed the thousands, the power of God, the power of Jesus to not stay in the grave, but to get up out of that grave, the resurrection power of God. God is all-powerful, omnipotent, and God was worshiped for his power. The word is uh, dunamis. And you can kind of hear the word dunamis, dynamite, like something powerful. God is powerful. And so the people then, now, we are to worship God because he's all powerful. And then the final word is the word strength. Now listen to me. Someone here today or listening online needs this because you are just tired Just, just kind of worn out, zapped of strength. Maybe that's you here today. And the reminder is that as we worship God, we find a strength that this world cannot give. God gives strength. Proverbs 18, verse 10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are saved. The word strength, that as I studied this, this word is a little different than power. The word strength that is used here is the idea of endurance. Like God's power and strength is not there for a short period of time, but it's like an ultra marathoner that runs 50 miles or 100 miles, like a long time, a long ways. God's power has endurance to it. Listen, folks, it'll get us through 2020. He'll get you through 2020. Just just rest on him. Rest in him. His power and strength is there. I have so much more I could say. (laughs) Man, it's good to be back preaching. Thank you for the opportunity to preach in this place and be here. I want you to add this. We talked about multitudes and the gospel reaching the world. How big is that? And then we talked about the people that are reached by the love of God are there in worship over forever and ever. i got to be quick. These are my last four things. They're very simple. But I want to give you four things to hold on to. Maybe make notes, maybe not. But these are just four things about worship that I want to at least plug. There's probably dozens we could talk about. But I'm going to give you just these. They're just reminders. Uh, We worship God for who he is and what he's done. 
What's worship all about? We worship God for who he is and for what he's done. What's number two? Understand worship as a way of life. It's not just Sunday. It's every day. It's an all-time thing. We, we were ma- you were made to worship. So we worship Sunday like this, but we're created to worship God on a daily basis. Number three, worship is a participation activity, not a spectator culture. Just something to, to know. Sometimes we see people on stage. or It's not like going to a movie. It's not like going to a concert where you just kind of sit there and you, 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 yeah, that's good. Real worship is like you're in your place right now. And there's something going on in your heart. Because God's speaking through his word. We're, we're in action. It's a verb. Worship is a verb. It causes us to do something. I probably shouldn't say this, but hey, I've been off for a month, so here we go. I've been doing this for a few years, right? <laughs> and I, I know sometimes I'm not the liveliest, maybe. Or maybe worship in the, the greatest. Like, but I have, I, I have, you just don't know what I see, and most people don't know that. I saw that. I have seen some of the biggest yawns during sermons that I had preached. You, you just wouldn't believe how long they yawned. Like, oh, how, how much longer do we have to go? How much more in this sermon? Like, like is this, this, this is bad. Let's get out of here. That's on you, man. Because you're not participating. And even God can use a, a vessel that's not perfect for sure. Worship is participation, not spectator. Final thing about worship is that worship fuels energizes and sharpens our entire spiritual life you want to be about God you want to live the life it's all mechanical unless there's just a love for Jesus and you worship him worship fuels us individually and as a church do you have fire to your faith do you have wonder to your worship It comes as we say, you know what, for a moment or two, I'm just going to be with God, or I'm going to join with others, and we're going to sing our hearts out. We're going to give all the might we have to God in worship. What happened in Revelation 7? The gospel reached every nation, tribe, people, language, mass gathering. And as they gathered, they worshiped. Then, yes, now, absolutely. We love the world. Because God first loved it and gave his son for it. Would you bow your head where you are, please? Father, thank you for the time we've been able to be in your word, the time we've been able to sing of the birth of your son, the exaltation of a little baby in a manger and the way that he changed the world. Lord, just take us back to when we were young. And remind us of the amazing grace that took us blind as we were and help us to see. We pray for our our church. We pray for the churches that we work with, that we might reach others for Christ by just sharing the love that you've given to us. You're a great God and greatly to be praised. We sing unto you. If you're here today, if you're online listening, God cares. You've never trusted him. Today can be a day where you turn from self, turn your life to him. Maybe the Lord needs to speak to you as we end out this year about your own worship life. And Today, he's just going to speak. So, Lord, we sing to you. And we love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Stand
together as we sing glory in the house. church family, you may be seated. Thank you so much for being here today. Hope to see you back next Sunday. I do hope you continue to celebrate the Christmas season and all that that brings with it. Let's 